Welcome back to the channel and today I have something that came up as a result of another video I did on Successful Contractor and the question came up, can I pay such and such person salary? So I thought that would be a great thing to talk about since I believe there are a bunch of people out there that are probably don't understand all the rules regarding this and it's one that you could be doing improperly. In the past, we've talked about 1099 employees or 1099 subcontractors versus employees. And today, let's talk about whether or not you can pay somebody salary versus hourly, which is a common mispractice or a place where people also run afoul of the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act. So without further ado, let's get into it. Before we do that though, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel so you don't miss any of our future content, please consider subscribing, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of this fantastic comment when we post a new video. And if you have any comments or questions, don't forget to post them below and we'll do our best to answer them in upcoming videos. Without further ado, let's get into it. So to clarify, I am not the foremost expert in any of this stuff. I am just a guy that has made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of things the hard way. If you have any questions about this, I suggest you speak with an accountant because they're gonna have a lot of the information that you need. Somebody like our accountant, James Seckman, can help you work through some of these things because the faster you catch it, eventually it will catch up with you. What happens in these cases is exactly what happened in our case, and that is somebody leaves on bad terms and is looking for any way to poke at you that they can and realizes maybe you've done something incorrectly and they're using that as ammunition against you. So those things happen. Your competitors can find out what you're doing and turn you in. Your employees can leave on bad terms, figure out what you're doing and turn you in. But eventually, no matter what happens, it will catch up with you, if not today, tomorrow, or sometime in the future. And the longer it's been going on, the more it will cost you and the higher the consequences. So don't risk it. A lot of people in efforts to try and even out their costs will try and salary employees. And in some cases that may be legal and in others it is not legal. We need to understand some of the laws regarding salaried employees. We need to know whether or not they're an exempt employee or a non-exempt employee. Exempt employees are those who are paid a regular salary and a predetermined amount of money distributed in regular intervals throughout the year. These employees do not qualify for minimum wage, nor do they receive overtime pay. And that's why a lot of people try and exempt their employees improperly is because they don't want to pay the overtime and they want to be able to even out their costs so that they can have a fixed cost throughout the month. So it's really enticing to try and pull this off, but you've got to make sure that you do it properly. Non-exempt employees are those who are eligible for a minimum wage and overtime calculated at one and a half times their hourly, hourly rate of pay. They are often paid hourly for the precise amount of time worked in a pay period. Those who are non-exempt and when they are eligible for overtime pay is subject to federal and state standards. So exempt employees can be paid a salary, non-exempt employees cannot be paid a salary. They must be paid hourly. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is whether or not this person qualifies to be exempt. If you look at the departmentoflabor.gov, there's a sheet, um, we'll post a website here, but a quick sheet, and it gives all the different exemptions. So the first one is an executive exemption, and there is a minimum salary defined, uh, which most people these days are probably going to meet not less than $684 per week. This employee's primary duties must be managing the enterprise or managing a customarily recognized department or subdivision of the enterprise. So these are typically management positions and regularly direct the work of at least two or more other full-time employees or their equivalent. Somebody in leadership that directs the operations of two other individuals. So you're thinking, okay, so I can do my foreman as salary. We'll get to that here in just a second. The employee must have the authority to hire or fire employees or the employee's suggestions and recommendations as to the hiring, firing, advancement, promotion, or any other change status of the employees must be given particular weight. So they have to be directly involved with the hiring and firing process and carry a significant amount of weight in those hiring and firing decisions. Then we have administration exemptions. Again, $684 a week. The employee's primary duty must be the performance or of office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operations of the employer or the employer's customers 
and the employee's primary duty include the exercise, discretion, and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance. This is people that are in leadership roles, but there is one key part in there. It says must be non-manual work. So if your foreman is out there uh, in the fencing business, if they're pounding any nails or if they're digging any holes or placing any concrete or doing any of the actual installs themselves, this would not qualify them for salary. But if you had a job superintendent that is doing no more than pushing paperwork in a trailer or in an office, the superintendents for that project that aren't doing any of the manual labor would qualify for salary in the construction business. Professional exemption, I don't know that we're gonna see a whole lot of that, but it may be. Again, $684 a week, the employee's primary duty must be the performance of work requiring advanced knowledge defined as work which is predominantly intellectual in character and which includes work relating uh, requiring the consistent exercise of discretion and judgment. The advanced knowledge must be in the field of science or learning. And so in our industry, what I think of when I think of these people is um, if you had like an on-site engineer, somebody that was working for you to do design build projects, then that person, because they're an engineering and received special instructions specifically for that trade would probably qualify for salary. Uh, creative professional, uh, again, $684 a week. Employees' primary duties must be the performance of work requiring invention, imagination, originality, or talent in a recognized field of artistic or creative endeavor. And that would be the guy on the other side of this camera. He falls into that category. He isn't out installing. He is a creative professional and therefore in our situation, he is qualified to be on salary or an exempt professional. Computer employee exemption, again, $684 a week. The employee must be employed as a computer systems analyst, computer programmer, software engineer, or similarly skilled worker in the computer field performing the duties described below. The applications of system analysis, I don't know that we're going to see a lot of that in the construction industry. You can see more about that on the website. We won't go into a whole lot of detail. Uh, but if you're hiring programmers and things of that nature, or maybe somebody to develop an app for your company, they would probably qualify for that exemption. Lastly, something that we see a whole bunch of in the construction trade is outside sales exemption. To qualify for the outside sales exemption, the following test must be met. The employee's primary duty must be making sales as defined in the Fair Labor Standards Act or obtaining orders, contracts for services, or for the use of facilities for which a consideration will be paid by the client or customer and the employee must be customarily and regularly engaged away from the employer's place or places of business. We have sales professionals within our business, so they are exempt professionals. Highly compensated employees, highly compensated employees performing office or non-manual work and paid a total annual compensation of 107,432 or more are exempt from the FLSA if they are customarily and regularly perform at least one of the duties of an exempt executive administrative or professional employee identified in the standard test for exemption. So if they are compensated at that level and they meet one of the other tests, then you can pay them salary. The exemptions provided by F LSA section 13A1 apply only to white collar employees who meet the salary and duties set forth in part 541. So if you don't consider any of these people white collar workers, probably that's a big red flag. The exemptions do not apply to manual laborers or other blue collar workers who perform work involving repetitive operations with their hands, physical skill and energy, FLSA covered non-management employees in production maintenance, construction, and similar occupations such as carpenters, electricians, mechanics, plumbers, iron workers, craftsmen, operating engineers, Longshoremen, construction workers, and laborers are entitled to minimum wage and overtime premium pay under the FS or FLSA and are not exempt under Part 541 regulations, no matter how highly paid they may be. So even though some of our people are bumping up against that highly compensated individual, because we are tradespeople, no matter what they do, as long as they're out there working with their hands and performing that trade, they're not qualified for a salary exemption. So there are very few people in our company that are qualified for salary. Those are people that are in management, uh, managing operations, and have the ability to hire and fire. So that's one of the key metrics that we use. Do they have any role in hiring and firing? Can they make hiring and firing decisions without myself involved or the other owner involved? So our salespeople, we have an office manager slash uh, location manager in Casper, and she is a salaried employee. We have the creative individual on the other side of the camera that is a creative individual 
and is salaried. We have another person that does editing and takes direction from our creative salaried team member, and he is hourly because we didn't feel like he qualified for that salary exemption. Our salespeople are all salary and they work on a base plus a commission. And so they're meeting all of the requirements for salaried employees or team members as we like to call them. So that leaves the question, if I have somebody like a secretary that answers the phone, are they qualified as an exempt individual? And the answer is no. And I can tell you that with absolute confidence because we screwed that up. We actually had somebody working as an office uh, administrator in one of our locations and ended up having to go before the Department of Labor and were audited and had all that stuff looked through and it was determined that she was not a qualified exempt individual because she didn't have enough say in the hiring and firing process, not to mention she was directed by other people. And so we ended up having to pay some overtime pay out to that individual, consequently no longer hire people in that position on salary. They're all hourly and we will continue to do that from now into the future. Another place that people can run afoul is let's say that you hire somebody, maybe improperly. Let's say that you have a receptionist and you decide that they're going to be on salary. You think that they may maybe meet all the requirements and then they decide to take a week off or they take a day off in the middle of the week and you dock their pay because of it. That is a key indicator that that person should be on hourly, not salary. You cannot reduce the pay for somebody if they didn't work all the hours because salary is defined as somebody that could work more or less than 40 hours a week. So when they work more, they don't get compensated, but also when they work less, they don't see a pay decrease. So if you are docking salaried employees or team members pay, you're also doing that incorrectly. And that's another big place where people can run afoul of Fair Labor Standards Act. If you're going to salary some of your team members, make sure, number one, first and foremost, in the construction trade, that they are not out there doing any of the installation. If they are a part of any of the installation and doing any of the manual labor, they are a non-exempt individual and should be paid by the hour. And it doesn't matter if you're building agricultural fencing or, and I'm saying fencing because I know that some people think that they're exempt because they're an agricultural fencer. The problem is, is that you are a commercial entity and you are not engaged in the commerce of agriculture. You're working for people engaged in the commerce of agriculture. So you yourself as a fence company that operates for profit are not exempt from those rules where a farmer may or may not be. So if they're doing any of the manual labor, not exempt. If they don't have significant input in the hiring, firing, and they have to have significant impact on the business and be able to make decisions with or without you as the owner, if you're watching this as an owner. Any of those people are non-exempt and should be paid by the hour. So if you're making this mistake, I suggest you correct it quickly before you run afoul like I did and get visited by the Department of Labor. And until next time, pay people the right way, avoid the trouble, and have a good dang day.